tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, 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 yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Wisdom Wednesday, and there's a lot of news to get to, and an absolutely terrific guest in longtime NFL official, and now CBS officiating analyst Gene Sterator. You know the deal with spreading the word via social media, sponsor confirmations, YouTube shout out. Today's patron of the day, patreon.com slash RT Media is Justin Stone. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. So it's nice to actually get a chance to see this guy for one of the first times this season. I've talked to him in a number of games, Ole Miss, Alabama, Georgia, Vandy, certainly NFL week one, but I don't actually get a chance to see him like this. A fellow Pennsylvania guy in uh, Gene Steratore, who Gene, honestly, I'm biased. Of course, you do an awesome job, man. It's so nice when I'm doing a game for CBS that you're on. Cause it's so nice to know that I had, that we have Gene if we need him, or just to kind of have a back and forth with you. Uh, listen, I really appreciate it because naturally when my shirt was a different color and you were playing, uh, that love for officials, you know, may not have been as great as it seems to be once we retire. Refs most definitely get loved a lot more once they've retired, Ross. But, and it's also good to uh, have my voice and my lips moving at the same time instead of a little picture on the side. I'll, although I like the fact that it's captured my age at a certain point and we'll <laughs> that for a little while, but it's great to be with you. And I've really enjoyed working with you here this season. All right. So um, it's funny because I actually, I'm a huge fan of officials. And I say that because I know in Pennsylvania, at least there's like a shortage, right? And these guys, you know, most of them are not doing it for the money, right? They, they, they believe in youth sports or teenage sports, even small college. And, and so um, I, I support officiating. I really do. And so let's talk about the NFL level, Gene. Let's just say I made you the czar of NFL officiating. It was, it hasn't been great this year. It, it was, it's been bad in recent weeks. I guess I'm just curious, blank canvas, and I'm sure the NFL asks your opinion about some of this stuff. What's the first thing you would do to try to improve it? Are there things with technology we could do? Is it making more stuff reviewable? I know people yeah. getting into the full-time officials thing. If there is something that could be done, what would be the first thing you would want to do? You know what? I mean, they're great questions, right? And, and to be honest with you, Ross, really – over the course of my career, um, technology became a much more integral part of the game and officiating. The challenge, no pun intended, uh, with the enhancement of technology also created a different way to officiate something in real time. Um, look, you, you spent years on the field, right? And, and, and so did I. I mean, if you really think about it, I was on a football field for over four and a half decades, you know, or four decades of my life, player and then official. And, and when you're down there in that real time moment, there are processes that you start to see. And then naturally, as you climb to the National Football League level, the speed factors, the ability to, to do things that players can do at that level that you just can't really experience at any other level, right? I mean, the hand fighting or their ability to get close to somebody without really fouling them uh, defensive backs abilities to put arms around someone's waist, but not turn them and still make a great play. The learning curve from the college space, regardless of what level of college you came from uh, to the national football league space is a very, very big movement upward. Right? So it is trying to get really good college officials and you, Look, the first thing you have to do, maybe the easier way to place this, Ross, honestly, is look at officiating as the 33rd team in the NFL. How would a general manager uh, build a team? Um, you're going to recruit. You have to scout. You have to train. Once you draft those players, you have to get them acclimated to this space as quickly as you can. So their foundations prior to even being in the NFL are very huge. 
because you do have to see kind of the best football that you can see before you take that step in most cases, just like players. Yeah, if they're 5% of the players that that come from a small college level or a, a mid-major level that end up and they're just really freaks of, of talent in the NFL space, sure. And the same could apply in the officiating world. But I think that's really where you start. You're really back to that space. And that is the comprehensive scouting, looking, talking to major college supervisors that are watching these officials week in and week out, as opposed to a one or two game snippet, even if you were a scout, and really getting in the weeds like that. I was fortunate. We had NFL Europe. Uh, so while I was working Big East football at that time, at a time when the Big East was really good with Michael Vick and Miami's resurgence, uh, going to the NFL Europe space, the differences in the rules, uh, working with a couple of NFL officials during the spring and summer uh, that were working with Europe and getting into that element was gigantic. I think now with the XFL, the USFL, uh, doing some of that, I think, in partnership with the NFL is a great place. Uh, but then once you get here, um, things change. Uh, players are faster. They do things that you really can't anticipate for the first couple of years in this space. So there is an element of that, uh, of that learning curve that must happen, just like the players have to adjust to this. And then to be quite frank with you, there are players that were great college players uh, that just couldn't make it at this level. And I think that's another piece of that accountability as you are trying to work in that space in the first few years. Um, and then there's the dynamic really of sprinkling experience with inexperience in different positions on the field, making sure that if you have an inexperienced line of scrimmage official, let's say, put an experienced downfield official next to him or her that can do that mentoring and, and that type of, 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 of teaching in the moment, right? So that is a gigantic portion of, of how this evolution of an official, in my humble opinion, needs to take place. Um, so there are so many different factors and variables. And then look, it's the NFL. Um, when you make a human judgment that's incorrect on this stage, the pressure, the scrutiny uh, of the country that rains down on you as a human and your family and the personal pressures that you now start to endure uh, is a factor as you get prepared for next week's game. Um, so there, it, it's a very comprehensive journey and, uh, and it takes an awful lot of work and, and ability to be able to be coachable like players and adjust to this. Um, so it, I wish I could say it was really easy. Uh, and, and, you know, we have it figured out. I don't think full-time officiating is the answer. We just don't have full-time seasons and uh, in games of, of the level that need to be played to get better on that space. And really, you know, although the, the country may think they're part-time, I can tell you when I was refereeing in the NFL, uh, a minimum of 20 to 30 hours a week of preparation each week, just like teams, scouting teams, scouting in matchups you're going to officiate, looking at their tendencies, their trends, and preparing your crew in that regard is a serious element to the whole process as well. So, uh, you know, the NFL has gone through 40, 50 newer officials in the last five or six years, uh, and uh, a pretty large swath of the referees went away rather quickly. I know when I retired and Hockey retired, Terry McCulley with three Super Bowls retired. John Perry had a couple of Super Bowls retired. So we had a pretty big exodus as far as the percentage of referees. That perception of, wow, I don't recognize these new faces. Who's handling this crew? Uh, that adds a little layer, right, of, uh, of not skepticism, but doubt. Uh, and listen, officials aren't getting love before the game starts. And now if you make that that mistake uh, during the game, uh, the, the rest of the 50-50 calls throughout that day, you're not getting any love for those either. So, But, but what, journey. Gene, what about, what about just utilizing the technology better? Like I'm thinking about Sunday night, week seven, Dolphins-Eagles, a terrible roughing the passer on Christian Wilkins. 
you know, Bradbury grabs the face mask of the receiver Wilson as he comes out of his break, whether that's a face mask or interference, it's yeah. one of them. I don't like why not make those plays reviewable or challengeable? I understand people say it'll make the game for well, not, not if there's only two challenges still. I, I just what what's the are you in favor of that or are you against making like roughing the passer or the Bradbury play like an, an egregious mistake that we can all see being able to fix that somehow. The fact that we unfortunately see egregious errors, right. Or missing the layup um, is, is creating this issue. Uh, on the other end, we tried to review pass interference a few years back and the levels of subjectivity as to what rises to the level of a foul will be debated every game all the time and that's where my take is on the subjective replay um that was always a fear of mine i got the black and white stuff i get it your point is a very fair point you can see a face mask it's not a subjective play he yanked his face mask right or you have also added so many layers to what is or is not roughing the passer right now to digest that play on the field in a split second is extremely difficult as well. So do I want to see it technology continue to elevate to make, you know, make this game closer to perfect? Personally, no, I, I didn't want to see technology in the game whatsoever. Uh, understanding the magnitude of every decision and some of the things that could be corrected rather quickly in the black and white space of review I was cool with that. Uh, the other stuff, yeah, we, we want them to be right all the time. But see, my fear is then, and you've played so many years, when is this play the most important play? Is it just the last two minutes that we start to look at all of this? Do we just allow them to a game uh, and look at uh, third and eight on your own 10? with 90 yards to go in a defensive hold that's really not a big flavored defensive hold that gives a team an automatic first down on third down and this in the series continues for four more minutes and we end up in punt from our own 40 and stick you at the five in the second quarter i lived in the world and so did you that's that's a titanic shift of how this game finishes it truly is in the second quarter so where do we draw that line as well, right? So as much as I know the public's uh, wanting of we have to get everything right, and I don't disagree with that, but the true answer and the best answer I can honestly give you is you've got to get better. This is the NFL. Um, if we continue to add bandages on things uh, my fear is there, it will never end. We end up with a sky judge or something in the booth that is now going to interject himself or herself down to the field. And then if they miss one, well, why didn't the sky judge do that? That's two years after they implemented. And does that ever stop? That's my fear of just continuing to grow it. I will also tell you that when you had pass fumble back in the day I started, you had to make the call, right? Is it a pass or a fumble? Is his knee down or isn't his knee down? Now, you referee safe. It's always a fumble. It's never a forward pass. Uh, the knee is never down unless it's so openly to open to you, right? So you also are programming the human computer on the field that has to be that aware and reacting for three straight hours and microseconds to now change that process and think about what can replay help me on. Oh, I'll just, I'll rule this way, even though I'm not, I might not be sold on it, if that makes sense, right? And then that trickle down, you may see then a hesitancy on a pass interference play because I'm not as aware of being forced to be in that level of focus and concentration throughout because these other situations, I have a safety net. So that's kind of my fear from the athletic side of it. Got it. Totally get it. Listen, hopefully we get more of these right so people don't have to drink as many Labatt Blue Lights as they're drinking during some of these games if the officiating's not good. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA. 
Buffalo, New York. Let's talk, Gene. I do a bunch of stuff for the Eagles. So they're talking a lot about the brotherly shove, the tush push. Yeah. There, there's two aspects of that I think are really interesting. I kind of want to hit both of them. First of all, and I've talked to some refs about this, they they clearly put a memo out to try to to try to officiate the play harder, which I can't remember that happening very often during a season where like they said, hey, look for this, look for that, look for that. It's almost like they're trying to do away with it without doing away with it. Uh, so that's question one. And then uh, I'll ask the second one, which is if they did try to ban it, how would they ban it? But question one, just your thoughts on the NFL clearly can't kind of uh, battening down the hatches a little bit on this play. Yeah, uh, it's a great point. And listen, um, it happens throughout the course of the season. If they see something trending or, or, or a tendency happening or, or, or mechanic, you're, you're absolutely right. At some point here in the last week or two, uh, I think two weeks ago we had neutral zone lineups, right, in the Eagles situation. The left guard's helmet was just breaking uh, the, the, the neutral zone in the back of the football. So without a doubt, you can feel that the NFL was reaching out or informing the officials that, listen, when you see this formation line up, there will be no gray area whatsoever, no hand in the neutral zone, no helmet. We want to separate this thing kind of like an onside kick is officiated, maybe differently in some regards than the opening kick of the game, where we're not breaking the plane of the kick line. We wait till a foot's down, but if it's an onside kick, if the plane is broken, it's a foul. So I don't disagree. It's obvious that they're making this thing be exactly right to the letter of the law to try to make sure it doesn't evolve into a more rugby style, which in my personal opinion, it already is. Uh, and then as you say too, my fear on the play is the massive amounts of strength and humanity that are bundled in that area and the forces that are pushing against each other. My fear is that ligaments pop somebody gets an injury in there because of this rugby style movement uh so moving forward how they massage it that's competition committee collectively with coaches officials stakeholders of the game deciding uh i would like to see it maybe limited uh maybe one teammate can help aid the runner right instead of multiple teammates or something to that effect but, but that's really where I think they'll head as it continues to be. We've yet to see the fake tush push and the, and the sweep or the pass, but we know it's coming. And like anything in the NFL, once someone is successful consistently with anything, the copycat part of the league takes place and we're seeing it happen. So I think that's where we're kind of headed. So, so that's my question I think is so interesting about it, Gene, is everybody's saying, uh, get rid of it, get rid of it. So I guess the only way they could really get rid of it that I had not heard that, that you limit it to just one person, because if they try to eliminate any pushing from behind of a teammate, you know, it's very natural on, let's say it's third and five and you hand the ball off or your receiver catches it and he's a yard short and the defense is stacking them up. I, I think it's very natural for an offensive lineman then to come in and try to push that pile forward to push it. I mean, that's, that's why you lift weights. That's why you're 320 pounds. So I guess I have a tough time figuring out exactly what the letter of the law would be, what the rule would be to not allow a teammate to push a player forward. I hadn't heard that one. Is that the only answer is to only let one guy do it? You know, look, uh, as you know, your podcast is not scripted. So uh, we're spitballing here, right? And, and as you ask the questions, you know, there are things we thought about and talk about naturally on how can you limit it. And, and you're perfectly, you know, right on saying aiding the runner is not a foul in that regard. Pulling the runner forward, different, but aiding the runner as far as the block, as you said, and that I can't see it being banned completely just for the couple examples that you gave. And you can't do that. Every rule change in the NFL and football, there's a reason why that rule book's 500 pages thick or whatever, because every time you tweak one piece, now there is the scenario of it's third and five and or whatever. So the unintended consequences of changing a rule and where that tentacle goes adds pages to the book. So I think it is something. Look, they spoke about it last year. 
at the competition committee. Uh, they voted, I believe, on it. Uh, I don't know if it came out officially, but you know, from the talks that I've had, they discussed this. And the majority of the teams are like, no, it's cool. We're all right with it. Uh, so at some point, it does come down to that, Ross. You know, that's where the stakeholders go. I think you have to get creative in saying, look, we don't want to ban the whole situation because it will grow throughout different play scenarios. But in this specific instance, what will we allow? What won't we allow? And I think limiting bodies allows at least an ability to continue with a play or that type of play, but not start to put a thousand pounds of humanity in a four foot area and have it happen. That's my fear. That's just my fear. Gene, awesome stuff. It's great to talk with you in this capacity. Great to see you, even though I know it's not your uh, your perfect headshot that they show on TV. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks, man. It's great. I hope to be back sometime too soon. Thanks. Hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Listen, when the clock stops on this podcast, or whenever a game clock stops, that's time to order in with DoorDash. Pizza cravings hit at halftime? That's ordering time. Dreaming about tacos during a timeout? Boom, they're on your doorstep. Wait, you want burgers, chips, dips, drinks, and wings instead? Even better. Order on DoorDash and get everything you want delivered without missing a minute of the game. Tuck's Takes. All right, Ross, huge news overnight as the Raiders fire head coach Josh McDaniels and general manager Dave Ziegler, and they replace them on an interim basis with Antonio Pierce and Champ Kelly. Wow. I mean, that was my Labatt take yesterday, Jack, that uh, Raiders fans deserve better. And evidently Mark Davis agreed, although I was pretty consistent the last couple of years. It really wasn't even to me about Josh McDaniels. It was about the fact that I never thought Mark Davis should have gotten rid of Rich Bisaccia. I thought what he did on an interim basis in, what was that, 2021? Really impressive. I mean, you know, Gruden gets fired, the emails, Henry Ruggs, Damon Arnett, and they go to the playoffs. They make the playoffs. They win all those close games. Then they were even close in that game against the Bengals at the very end. thought it was a no-brainer to give Bisaccia a three-year deal, if it went really poorly the next year, then move on. Instead, he gave a six-year contract to Josh McDaniels, only to fire him after a year and a half. Unfortunately for the Raiders, it appears as if their owner doesn't really know what's going on. Antonio Pierce was an undrafted rookie free agent with in Washington with me back in 2001. It's kind of funny to see him as the coach now. Biggest trades from yesterday's deadline involved the Washington Commanders as the Bears trade a 2024 second round pick for Montez Sweat and the 49ers trade a 2024 third round pick for their defensive end, Chase Young. Yeah, I got a lot to say about this. And we're in the fourth quarter of the podcast. That's where the magic happens in football. It's where games are won, where champions are made. In business, it's where sales teams become legends. That's why HubSpot built Sales Hub to give sales reps the deal making tools they need to win their Q4. Sales Hub's prospecting workspace organizes your schedule, goals, and to-do list. In one place to save your team precious fourth quarter time, and smart sequences help sales reps close deals faster than ever. So get ready to dominate Q4 with Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com slash sales. So I totally understand Washington moving on from one of these guys because they weren't going to necessarily pay them both. I can't say I totally understand trading both of them. Um... I'll, and I'll also say this, pretty aggressive, I would say, by both these teams to acquire these guys who have half a season left on their contracts. You know, I, I would have wanted to make sure I already got them locked up to a long-term deal. I guess the Niners look at it like they'd get a comp pick back for a third rounder anyway. But the Bears, I, I don't really understand. I mean, that's going to be a top 40 pick that they just gave up for Montez Sweat. They better sign him long-term. Other moves, Vikings trade a sixth-round pick for Josh Dobbs, and they get a seventh-round pick with that. They then trade Ezra Cleveland, the offensive guard, to the Jaguars for a sixth-round pick. Lions trade a sixth-round pick for Browns wide receiver Donovan Peoples-Jones, and the Bills trade a third-round pick for Packers defensive back Rizul Douglas and a fifth-round pick. It's just wild. I mean, out of all those, the one that jumps out to me, it's wild that my guy Josh Dobbs might, uh, might end up starting yet again on like a week's notice 
I called the last game of the Josh Dobbs era for the Arizona Cardinals. People will remember that for decades, that I was the, the announcer for the last game of that era. Other than that, I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shoutouts. Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, how about SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Go-Bangles.com, BackOfficeSchedule.com, and the best gift I'm aware of for a loved one, the best keepsake, it's MyFrontPageStory.com.